morning. I feel special today. Today is the start of my second year here. Seems like it's been a month. But I'm so glad that you're here with me this morning. And so glad for you that are watching online. You know, it's good to be here at Grace Church this morning. Now, two weeks ago, Jamie, my wife, joined me up here and we discussed marriage. Last week, I was up here solo, single, all by myself, to talk about singleness. Today, we're going to move to parenting. So, uh, as I've said before at the last two messages, if you think this does not apply to me, well, it may. Because maybe if you don't have kids, that could, if you don't have kids, that could change in the future. Or you may know somebody that has kids, and I tell you what, I can't tell you the number of people in this church when I was a kid growing up that I looked up to. And they didn't have kids, but I looked up to them just like they were a mom or a dad. So now, so there may be something here for you to listen to today. Now, I have children. I have my son, Lynn, who's 29, my daughter, Leah, who's 24, and then our son, Chris, is 16. And I can tell you, and you probably know this already, parenting can be tricky. But if you know anything about kids, it's this. They need a spiritual guide. And God gave my kids, well, me. I'm it. And God gave me knowledge to support them to do what was right. But we have to know where to start. So I believe the best place to start is to know your own child's phases. There's developmental milestones that, just like when you take your kid to the pediatrician for a healthy doctor's visit, they'll tell you on the scale if they're, if they're getting uh, tall as the normal or, or maybe they're taller than the normal or you know things like that. These are similar, but these encompass the spiritual development of our children, too. And we as parents do our kids a disservice if we don't understand and pay attention to these milestones. So we want to give you a, a down and dirty look and an overview of some spiritual development of children as they grow through what we call phases. So buckle up and grab the insert that's in your worship folder and follow along, because here we go. The first encompasses infants and toddlers through the preschool years. And this is an incredibly sweet time of, of bonding and a time when each child is, is basically training their parents in the care of tiny human beings. And this is an, an integral part of the development for parents because all of our energy and all of our focus are now centered around meeting the needs of this tiny miracle that God has entrusted us with. And that is why this phase is appropriately entitled Embrace Their Physical Needs. In other words, keep the kid alive, okay? This is where the basics of eat, sleep, and play are established and where love and trust are founded and kids learn. And I'm okay to explore learn because I can trust that the parents have my back. And this is so essential because it sets the stage for the rest of these fundamentals to build upon. And if our kids don't learn to trust and love in this first stage, well, it will not feel organically good to them if when they try to love and trust our Heavenly Father the way that they're intended to. Our next phase is the elementary years, and your child has built so much love and trust into the foundation that they're ready to spread their wings a little bit, and this is when the, this is the stage when your kid's unique personality traits and, and desires and their talents start to weed themselves out and come to the forefront, and that's why this stage, we encourage you to engage in their interests because they need a reminder and affirmation of their worth and position in the world from their family to have confidence and to show the world how great they are. 
And they also need the routine of boundaries and rules that flourish under the concrete thinking. It's, it's that hallmark age. And, and in this way, they learn to distinguish God's ways from the ways of the world, to trust in God's character. So they, they've moved now from, I can trust my parents and my, and my nuclear family because they feed me and change my diapers, to I can trust what God says about the world because my family who already has proven that they love me and I can trust them, they say that God is trustworthy. Next, middle school. Students here are beginning stages to shift between concrete thinking to abstract thinking and this is a paramount in the Christian faith. Hard questions are going to be asked in these years as the middle schooler begins transformation from just being everything that you say and understanding and hopefully to owning their own faith. Around here we call it having a first-hand faith and it's no longer only passed down from generations to the Christ followers that were before them. It's them becoming their own. Their, this stage is important. And then it sets up the final stage, high school and beyond. And at this age and stage, I know the temptation for parents is to worry about late nights out and dollar signs and long college applications and whether they have learned all the skills that you set out to teach them before they reach adulthood. And let's not forget to prioritize these worries under the heading fuel the passion by turning my students' gifts into their own personal ministry. Students at this age are looking towards college and careers and starting families and of their own and picturing to the full and exciting future. And as loved ones of kids in this phase, it is our responsibility to, to mobilize their potential. And the fact of the matter is that the kingdom of God needs these students to be exactly who they are in the exact place they find themselves in order to shine God's light in the way God created them to shine. And we need to help them to find the potential and see where it fits in in God's plan. And hopefully as we come to this stage as parents, we are able to look back in the line of the kids' spiritual development and see the interventions over time that match the age-appropriate spiritual development. And as we look back, the verse we echo in our minds is 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 16. It says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know that those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And those of you with kids, or maybe in the first couple of phases, let this be our prayer and our parenting goal. And as I say goal, I would say 99% of parents want to be better parents, regardless if you're a single parent, married, foster, guardian, grandparent, raising children. I would argue that most of us just want to be better. And the same thing rings true for the spiritual development of our kids, even our kids who are all grown up too. I believe we all have realized the importance of raising our child up in a way that they can know Jesus on their own. But what happens to our kids? What happens when those kids ask about heaven and hell? What happens when that child experiences crisis for the first time? What happens when our family begins to fall apart? How do we keep pushing our child to grow in their faith, even when we don't feel capable or equipped to lead? What if we feel like our kid doesn't care or doesn't want to listen to us or maybe is just checked out? Let me give you some comfort. 
Surveys and statistics from all sorts of secular media and Christian outlets still point to the parents being the top influencer of a child's life, regardless of their face. Your child might have an awesome teacher, coach, neighbor, small group, or pastor, but they are still clinging onto the words and advice from their parents. You are the one who's living with the child. And let me put it this way. On an average, a child or a youth will spend 40 to 50 hours a year at church. And we hear that and we think, oh, that's great. That's pretty good. But that's a contrast to how often kids spend time at home with their parents. And the average kid will spend about 3,000 hours in a given year with their parents. Now, with that statistic, we don't who do you think maybe has the most leverage? It is the parent, of course. So this leads us to the question we want to answer today as a church family. How can I be the spiritual champion of my child's life? And this is a question that applies to every type of parent. Married, single, grandparent, foster, adopt, guardian. Maybe even some of us who don't have children, but we spend a considerable amount of time with a child we treat as our own. And what I mean by a spiritual champion is how do I champion my child's faith? How, do I, how can I be the one to foster and encourage and build up my child's faith? And I tell you, I don't have all the answers. I don't have to be perfect, and neither do you. We just need to point our kids to the one who is. So, number one, own my spiritual journey. That's what I need to do. Simply put, I can't give what I don't have myself. I can't show my kid how to ride a bike if I don't know how. I have to lead out the life for my kids, and I do that in my own journey. Church, did you know that the average 50% of college students will leave the church after high school? College students leave after high school. And only 20% of those who leave will actually come back. I know this to be true because I was one of those ones that left. And thank God I came back. But we have a generation that's fleeing the church. And their faith is crumbling for this generation. And of course, this pains me as a pastor. But this stings even more as a parent. Because I don't want my kids to be far from God and far from the church. I don't want their faith to crumble. There's too much at stake. Nehemiah felt tension. Nehemiah, a servant of the Lord, felt led to return to Jerusalem from a distant land to rebuild the walls of God's holy city. It was abandoned and the walls had crumbled, but Nehemiah gathered as many Israelites that he could muster and he began to rebuild those walls. And when they hit the halfway point, the enemies of Israel were raging and they were ready to strike. But Nehemiah then gathered everyone, men, women, and children, and he gathered the families and he said this, Nehemiah 4, 13 and 15. He said, therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall and exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. And after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. You see, Nehemiah knew he could protect the wall if he involved his families. He knew the passion that parents have for their own children. What have we fought for our families, our sons, our daughters, our spouses, and our homes? As a parent, we are willing to fight for our kids and to protect them, but what if we fought for their faith? What if we did everything we took, we took, we did everything it took so that our, not only our children, but this generation whose walls of faith are crumbling would know God? And it starts with me. It starts with you. It starts with each of us spending time with the Lord on our own. 
And it starts with me participating in corporate worship. That means coming to church or joining a small group, reading the Bible, having spiritual conversations with others. That's why our deep dive class is so important. It starts with me fighting for my own journey with the Lord so that I can fight for the, my child's journey. It's true, I, I know it may seem simple to that parenting to talk focused first on our own faith, but the truth is you can't do the rest of these steps without taking care of your own. It's like the airline, when that bag comes down for the oxygen, you're supposed to put it over yourself before you help someone else. Because if you're not breathing, you're gonna pass out and can't help somebody else. Our faith needs to be caught and taught. Yes, these are things that we could and should be teaching our kids about faith. But monkey see, monkey do brings about a whole lot better results if we tie it to the maybe number two in our worship notes, which is cultivate our spiritual habits. To learn more, let's look at Deuteronomy 6. This passage of Scripture truthfully carries the weight of what we want to emphasize today. Let me unpack this a few verses at a time so we can really study it on Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. And here's the echo of what I'm saying. Here is a command from Moses to the Israelites, but one that still resonates with us today. For us to love the Lord with all of our strength, all of our soul, and we haven't even gotten to the part about our families yet. It starts with us. So let's keep reading into verse 7. And here's where it really gets to the nitty gritty. Verse 7 says, Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. So, I guess, wait a minute, I'm the one. I'm the one that's supposed to teach my children about spiritual things. Why doesn't it say that incredible children's department of Grace Church is where those conversations are supposed to take place? I mean, hasn't God been over there and seen that? Didn't he see the amazing volunteers we have back in the children's department? No, the Bible is clear here. This is our fight. This is our responsibility. Remember those 3,000 hours you're, you have with your kids compared to the church's 50? Talk to your kids about the matters of faith. When you sit at home, when you're out walking, when you're in your everyday walking around life, when you lie down, when you get up, when you're in the car on the way to school and at soccer practice and before meals. Because when things at school get tough, we want the student, your student struggles with a relationship they, we want them to talk about it. Talk about matters of faith and what the Scripture says about the problem. Teach your children where to look in times of trouble and where to give praise when praise is due. And this is not only the job of the church. Don't get me wrong. Families of our church, we are amazing and welcoming and structured in teaching and they fit development on the spiritual stage, meeting needs while having a ridiculous amount of fun over there doing it. And our youth and children's ministries are filled with loving individuals who are educated and experienced in kindling and keeping the ideas of faith and following Christ foremost in the minds of our kids. But this cannot be the primary source for your kids of faith education. Ms. Vina, Ms. Jamie, and all the volunteers who have been pouring into your kids are counting on you to keep the conversation going. So when you get up and when you lie down, keep it going. Let's read verse 8. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames, on your houses, and on your gates. Moses instructed the Israelites to tie them on their hands and bind them on their foreheads so that God's words would be constant in their thoughts and actions. 
So what do these actions look like for parents in 2018? In your worship folder, we gave you a chart that helps break down the, the phases we talked about earlier. Under each heading, there are some specific ways that you can engage with your child inside that phase. And briefly, let me point out a few habits that we can do together as a family, no matter what phase. First, pray with your kid. When she prays that that kitty cat that she tormented all day will come back and love her tomorrow, pray about that kitty cat too. Pray about that upcoming project at work that you may have, be having difficulty with so that your child has an example when that hard test comes up at school and they will know the, the words to pray. Pray around the dinner table and in the car. Make prayer sticks if you need to so that school-aged children have some direction in their prayers. Pray. Friends, pray for our kids. And after you have said the prayers and your kids are tucked in their, nicely in their beds and they've finally forgotten that you finally get to binge watch that TV show that you've been waiting on, pray again. Recenter your heart and, in prayer and let your kids see and hear that you do it. Caught more than taught. Next, do a devotional together. If you don't know how to pray out loud or don't know what you might be important for, your, for maybe a tween girl to learn, find an age-appropriate devotional. Buy two or three of them. Do them together. How better to teach them to then to center their eyes on Christ than the going-ons around them than doing it together. I have a cherished picture. It's from a few years ago of Leah and Chris studying the Bible together. You don't know what that does for a father. Capitalize upon those moments. Impress them on your children. Lastly, talk to your kids about their faith. Open up in conversation early and often. This could be used as good advice for talking about everything emotionally changing, charging with your kids. Talk about it early before you think they need to hear it. Open those lines of communication. Tell them that they are loved and they are wanted before God even gave them to you. Tell them that they were crafted and designed by God for a specific purpose. Talk to your kids often about how something you read and your devotional helped you deal with an issue at work or when you needed to hear what God had to say about a decision before making it. Normalize this for your kids. Make it a thing that we talk about often around here. And then when they grow old, they will not depart from it. Finally, we can be the spiritual champion of our children's lives by number three, expand our spiritual family. While earlier we emphasized the singular influence that a parent has over a child, I think we can all agree that there are other influences in a child's life. And quite frankly, we need them. We need other people to speak truth and love into our kids' lives and to cheer them on and to give them sound advice. Like we've been discussing for the past few weeks, our nuclear family is not only the family that can have the influence on our, our lives. The Bible shares with us that the relationship that we can have with others expands our nuclear family to the family of God. And we see this played out with the Apostle Paul because he writes about his protege Timothy in 1 Timothy 1-2. And he says, To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul, who was a single man and had no children, saw Timothy not only as a son, but as a spiritual son in faith. And it doesn't matter if you're blood related. They were family. And we need more of Paul's young Timothys. Our kids need other people in their lives who will speak truth and point them to Jesus. 
Ask your children if they had a problem and they felt like they couldn't talk to mom and dad. Well, who would it be? Who would they talk to? We ask this because we know there's going to be a day and time when they won't want to talk to mom and dad. Mom and dad have become so lame. Or maybe they fear the consequence. Parents of teenagers, I think you know this. However, I realize that I still have influence. And you may want to say, who else is going to have influence on my child? So that it will impact their lives. So list off maybe the people in the Grace Children's Department or who are part of your child's life or, or other people here at Grace Church who are people, our kids, or, or that they could say, our, they could talk to our kids and we're together. Who could they turn to? Recently, a, a school in Texas was having a breakfast with dad event. And I want you to see what happened at that school. Check out this video. I did it because somebody did it for me. Right. Mentors definitely had a huge impact in my life. Because I had so many men in my life when I was growing up yeah. that did for me what I'm hoping I can do for some of these guys. That's beautiful. And this is what I believe the kingdom of God looks like. Adults stepping in the gap for kids. Men loving and encouraging them. Women pouring into the lives of young women. This is a picture of the kingdom of God. This is a picture of the church. And boys and girls in our church need men and women to step up and step in the gap for them. They need to be other influencers in their lives. So come help out. Help out in the Grace Children's Department. Give a high five, an encouraging word. It could be the difference in a child's life. Now I covered three things that we believe will help you be the spiritual champion for your child and I also want to encourage you because we at Grace Church, well, we're kind of already doing this, but when we baptize children, we ask parents to have a first-hand faith, and then we ask parents to commit to a spiritual habits with their child, and then we turn to the congregation as the church needs to help in the spiritual development of this child. And this is one way we help pass on the faith. It isn't just a ceremony, it's a covenant. And let me get real personal. They need you to do this as their family. Parents, grandparents, and guardians, you can do this. You can be their champion. And God has given you a church who will help out as much as possible to support you as a parent and to help let your child know Jesus. Grace Church loves families. And we also love Jesus. You know, we're, today we celebrate Holy Communion. Because Jesus, even though he didn't have to, 
he decided that he would do for us. He went to the cross for us. And then the night before he did it, he even thought about his friends, his, his family, so to speak, because he gathered them together for one last meal. Even though he knew most of them were going to run off, even though he knew there was one amongst them that would betray him, he took some bread. He gave thanks to God, and he broke that bread. And he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took a cup. Once again, gave thanks, and he gave it to them. And he said, this is my blood that is poured out for you and for many for forgiveness of sins. Once again, he didn't have to do this. But he saw you. He saw each and every one of us, even before we were born. And he didn't want to be in heaven without us. In the Methodist Church, you're not, uh, there are no rules as far as communion. You don't have to be a member, you don't have to be Methodist. All you need is a desire to have a closer relationship with God and a desire that your fin sins be forgiven. We use juice here because we know some people struggle with things stronger. But the band is going to play another song. And as they play, I invite you to stand and I invite you to come as the Spirit leads to partake in Holy Communion. <laughs> 